transitioning to the main screen. Thank you, everybody, for being here this evening. Uh, like I said, I know I sound funky. Uh, if you guys haven't been catching up, uh, I uh, don't have the Rona. I am fully vaccinated. Uh, however, uh, vaccines do not save you from the yellow plague here in South Georgia of pollen, and I got a nasty sinus infection the earlier part of this week. And man, today is the first day I've actually been able to really do anything. Um, I did a live stream earlier from the shop, which I probably shouldn't have. I couldn't really think all good. And uh, thank you guys for, that were there for, for putting up with that. And I'm still not 100%. I'm sure you can hear it. Um, I'm not sure how long I'm going to be able to talk. There's going to be a lot of coughing, a lot of snotting. I apologize. I will try to mute the microphone while I do that. But that's where we are. Uh, a couple things. Uh, I am going to try to get a video out tomorrow with an update on everything. I know I talked about uh, picking up this extra job and whatnot. We're not doing that. Uh, got a little bit of a direction for everything else. And uh, one of the big things I want to tell everybody, and I know, like I said, and I actually we've got probably, yeah, we've got about 20 folks in here. Uh, normally we have about 80 when I have something big scheduled, and I have absolutely uh, gotten chewed out by a lot of people here in the past couple of weeks about scheduling the live streams. And uh, there's a bit of a problem here, and I really want to address this in the other video, but I know most of you guys are going to watch this anyway, so I'll, I'll explain it here. Uh, you know, going through the workday here has me everywhere. It is incredibly difficult to schedule anything in advance simply because depending on what I'm working on the shop and where I have to be, uh, it's really bad. Um, and the prevalent thought has always been better not to schedule something and do something impromptu than to schedule something and not be there. Um, I know there's a ton of you guys that are, are wanting to have something a little more scheduled. But here, the issue is, is that when I schedule stuff, when I do get to make it, uh, I don't end up producing as much. Like today, uh, really kind of two impromptu live streams, and that's content that I would not have put out there had I tried to plan something because a lot of this stuff is relatively spur of the moment. So I absolutely hear you guys. Um, I'm working on it, and we'll, we'll I'll see what I can do on that end. Again, this week has been kind of a cluster hump simply because I have been snotting and hacking. It's just not been a good week. But as we move into next week, hopefully I'm going to be a little bit better, and we're going to get some good stuff filmed. But I'll have another video out, uh, a standard video out about that to let everybody know what's going on, especially those of you in the Patreon into things. So that's where we be. Um, getting into tonight's topic, uh, today I was actually working in the shop making a few hammers. Uh, like I said, for those of you that ordered hammers, every one of them got out the door day before yesterday, I believe. And uh, I bought enough steel to go ahead and restock and resupply the website. So I've been trying to get myself out there and work on hammers. Um, but as I'm doing this, if you guys have ever done punching on that end, especially for hammerheads, my OCD drives me nuts because as I'm punching it, if that thing gets off, if it's not like a perfect punch, uh, I lose my crap. It's, it's terrible. I mean, it's really, really freaking awful. I cannot stand it. If it gets over to the side a little bit, you can actually see it's not quite perfect. And man, what a what an aggravation, right? But I had a friend of mine that was looking at trying to recreate a Roman era claw hammer, and they were there's a few photographs of these things out there, and uh, he finally found a couple of photographs of originals in a museum, and I got to looking at it, and it was like terrible, like the eye was really over to one side. It would look like a hammer that I screwed up, right? And I said, man, boy, must have been sucked whoever made that. But then I got to thinking because one of the um, one of the the most famous finds out there of the old blacksmith's tools was something called the Mastamere find, and this was a Viking age tool chest that was found intact with a really interesting lock mechanism, very advanced for the time, that was filled with a blacksmith's tools, like a bunch of them. And I've seen pictures of these things. It's very well documented. There's a couple of there's a couple of YouTubers that have uh, remade some of the pieces and all that kind of good deal. But I remember seeing a pair of tongs uh, that came from the Mastermere find, and they looked terrible. Now I know that they were old. I know that they were rusty, but 
it didn't it didn't really match up with what I expected a Smith of antiquity to do. You know, we Smith, because we enjoy it, you know, it's not a necessity of life. Back then it was a little bit different. These are guys that were at it all day, air day, as they say. But I pulled up a photograph here, and I want to show you what I mean. So, it's, you know, recently we've actually been working on tongs. You know, I've made sure that we've had, um, you know, that the bolsters are right, that the boss is right, that the, the, the actual handles are even. You know, I wanted to make a good pair of tongs properly made, right? <clears throat> because we're recreating a, a lost art, and we want it to be correct. Okay, let's take a quick look. All right. Let's see if I can uh, open this up right here. Come on. Ah, give me some zoom. Give me some zoom. That is the crappiest zoom I've ever seen in my life. Okay. All right. Well, here's what we're going to do. All right. Now, these are, are right here. These are going to be uh, some tongs from the Master Mirror Find, if I'm not mistaken. So, look at these tongs right here. Now, I wish I could blow this up real quick. Let's see, where's, do I have a zoom in here? View, I have a zoom, there we go. Zoom, zoom, zoom in. Control, plus, 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 plus. Okay, there we go. Now we're cooking with gas. We're gonna be still at uh, potato quality here, but come on, you son of a monkey butthole. All right, this is just not working out for me. Let's uh, zoom back out. All right. Well, we're gonna we're gonna look at this what we got here. All right. If you this son of a <laughs> all right, hang on, guys. I'm working with this. I promise. What is this crap? Just want to get. All right, right here. If you look, one there's really no boss to speak of, right? Uh, and if you look closely, you can actually see that the rivet is offset to one side. So it's not even centered in the bar. So this would be a screw up uh, in the shop, right? Okay, so let's look at this pair right here. Now it looks like the rivet's a little bit better centered, um, but you can see where he actually turned the handles. He actually hammered it too much. That's been thinned out too much. And if you look at it up the top, look here. The reins are not uh, the reins are not uh, even at all. They didn't take the time to clip them or make them even so that you could use rings. It's just not there. This hammer right here looks pretty good. This one now there's probably again rust has affected this, but rust didn't make that screwed up hole right there, right? So this is arguably a toolbox from a professional smith of the time, and his tools are not something that I would say were good looking tools in my shop. It would be something that I would, um, yeah, I think, I think it's, it's looking, we can't see anything. Why not? Why, aren't, why can't you see anything? No? Can't see anything? The hell? Oh, shit. Mm, excuse me. That's when we turn this off. Okay. There we go. Sorry. Sorry. My bad. Like I said, I took the stupid pills today. There we go. Don't worry. There we go. I had it in studio mode, so when I switched it, it didn't move it. My bad. <laughs> I try to keep it clean for you two, right? All right. So let's go over this one more time. This one right here. Uh, if you can see these tongs right here, you can see that rivet is actually set to the right. That's where I was talking about there. All right. And the length of the, the reins, again, not both of these are not right. You can see right here on the back side of the boss, that's been thinned too much. That's not rust. That is actually, you know, uh, that was actually an error in the forging. And so is the length of the jaws here. The hammer here, that's probably not rust. Uh, this side's been thinned way too much. And you can see the line of it is in line. It's just a bad drifting. So again, these are the tools of a master smith uh, at that time, and they they suck. If they were in my shop, and if if I went to a if I went to another smith shop and he was using tools like that, uh, I do believe that I would say to myself, well, clearly something he screwed up and uses in his shop, but it's something that wouldn't be on display because clearly that's you know that's incorrect. Well, 
here we are. Go back over here. Now I, I flipped through. There's some. There's there were a ton of tools in that chest. And see, you see this guy right here. So look at this. Look at this nasty boy right here. Look at what a bad cut. And you can't really see it here, but look how badly formed uh, these reins are. Again, no boss. Ragged cut there. Now this was probably nice and clean in its time. That's a pretty good. That's a pretty good split. But they look really nothing like the tongs that we make a lot of today. Uh, let's see, I think this came off of iForge Iron here. Uh, this was a replica deal. Let's see, I'm getting I'm getting feedback here. Got to check the feedback. Uno Memento. I always have to answer messages from my mother. If you guys don't like it, well. There we go. But you can see here that, um, and this is, what, this is another pair of tongs that was in the chest. Uh, again, no boss to speak of, super simple. I mean, this is very well executed. The smith that did this, I mean, fitted very well. Everything matches up. But again, does not look like the tongs that we're kind of taught made today. All the books I've ever had really have never had tongs that look like that, right? So that was something that really kind of got me thinking because, you know, even when I'm teaching tongs and I'm teaching you guys stuff, you know, the, the sources that I'm drawing from are relatively recent. You know, the books I've seen from the late 1800s, you know, with that nice boss that's on there, all of this is relatively recently. And when you go back and you start looking at these old tools, they really don't look like anything that we make today. And I'm like, man, that's kind of that's kind of freaking wild, you know? So let's uh, just take, let's check out a few more. Let's go back here. Uh, Smoogles, that extra piece in the tongs, I think it was actually, I think it was a locking mechanism. Actually, here's a, here's a picture of it right here. Yep, that's exactly what it was. So you guys have seen my lock rings, right? I use rings across the tongs. Well, they actually had a bar hooked into this so that you have apparently so that you could actually grab several different sizes. Now, get this. I love this. You see this pair of tongs? <clears throat> this is uh, Russian tongs here, okay? Um, so what it means is that they did not have sets of tongs that was designed for all the stock that they were using. That's because, as I said, that back in the day, you didn't get such a variety of different uh, steels from the ironmongers. Those are the guys that actually made the iron and steel, right? You know, it came in three sizes, as I always in enjoy saying, uh, small, medium, and oh my God, right? So here you have a set of tongs that has a what is essentially lock rings that allow you to lock um, it at different on two different size pieces of metal. All right, let's see what else we can find here. There's there should be all kind of good junk in here. There's a lot of there was a lot of reproductions. Let's see, okay, Viking Age tools. A friend of mine's been making these Viking Age keys. See, these are all very nice tools here, all very well made. But I was trying to find some more of the, the old, the original stuff because it really looks like horse poo poo. I mean, when you go to the museums, I said I should have found some more before I went on there, but when you go to the museums, uh, like there's a Museum of Appalachia uh, up in Tennessee, and they've got a lot of stuff that starts from the, the late 1700s. And a lot of the originals that I've seen are just not well built. They're, the eyes are, if you have hammers, you know, one of the things I hate most is when I'm doing a hammer and the, the eye actually cants to the left or the right, drives me up the wall. But I, I thought about it and all of the original hammers that I've seen that were not factory produced, 
almost all of them were candid. They were off. They were not right. And these were the tools that these folks, these professionals were working with. The only time I've seen consistent tooling is when it came out of the factories, even toward the late 1700s. You got to remember that, you know, by the late 1700s Revolutionary War area, uh, the Industrial Revolution had already hit England and a lot of Europe. And so you had factories uh, that were cranking out stuff in these huge press dies, basically, uh, under trip hammers and things of that nature. You know, when we looked at the tilt hammers or the, ham the water hammers they had in the Pioneer Axe video, you saw there that they had three or four different hammers, each with very specific dies in the hammer to do very specific things with the metal. Let's see what else I can dig in here. I'd like some original photos, but they are rather hard to find. Uh, looking, 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 don't see crap. Okay, well, apparently it's very difficult to find good drawings on that anyway. Here's something, is that from Master Mirror? I tell you what, I am about so done with Pinterest <laughs> to be, <laughs> oh my God. All right. No, that's not it anyway. Anyway, so one of the things, guys, that if you ever get the chance to go, especially if you're in Europe or because here in the States, we have a big issue with the fact that we only have about 250, 300 years uh, of, of history, right? Any of what we call modern history where we have artifacts that aren't stone tools, okay? Um. You know, when you go to Europe, you know, we, if you don't know this, as an American, we freak out if we find something that's 100 years old, right? I mean, if we flip out, you know, whereas when you go to England, you know, if something's not five or 600 years old, you know, what's the freaking point, right? No, we flip out over stuff that's 100 years old. So we really, you know, there's kind of a hard start to where our archaeological, modern archaeological stuff goes. So almost everything we have here was normally of some type of industrial manufacture. Now, of course, we've got a few pieces that were handmade by the local smithies, but you've got to remember that one of the prized trade items, even before the revolution, was scalping knives, actual steel knives. And these were being stamped out in Sheffield, England by the thousands. These were industrial made uh, items. So it's really hard to say that these knives from 1700s, you know, are hand forged, kind of, sort of they are, but it was a lot more about stamping and grinding even at that point than it was custom forging out a sword or, or things of this nature. Uh, remember, uh, you had factories producing bladed and, and edged weaponry uh, even in the time of Napoleon. You know, you're arming hundreds of thousands of troops. There was no quality. You need a blade that would kill and that's how it went. So when we start looking back at these more toward the medieval end of things before the industrial revolutions, I always expect the tooling to be very, I mean, to be well, because these people are living by it. But every example that I've seen by far, unless it was like a presentation model, uh, the tools that these people are using kind of suck. And they look like a beginner smith today. Uh, that's something that's always blown my mind because, you know, in my shop, I've never sent a hammer out that wasn't evened up in there. You know, if, if one side was swollen to the side, it didn't look right, I didn't send it out. If I made a pair of tongs and the boss was kind of skewed to one side, you don't send it out. That's bad stuff. It still works, but it's not, it's not skilled work. However, it, standing in contrast to that, we have all this archaeological evidence of even Smiths back to the Roman times using tools that I would turn my nose up at as a Smith today. So there's this weird question of asking, you know, were the Smiths of antiquity better than we were? Because that's, that's one of the things we always, we always like to imagine. You know, if there's some Viking Age Smith uh, you know, or there's some Smith in a Viking village, you know, we, we really want to say, man, this is the, you know, the epitome of the craft. This is when the craft was the craft. But at the same time, a lot of the things they turned out were 
garbage. I mean, this this wasn't somebody that went to university or went to be educated somewhere. This was literally the guy that learned from the guy that humps the goats and that happened to start working on the metal. So there's no educational pedigree, even in my time, you know, in, in time of the internet. You gotta understand that we have we have an incredible access to knowledge and education that they never did. Um, you know, it's you know it's one of those situations where uh, you run into the fact that they made things that worked, but a lot of the things they probably didn't work well. And I saw Octavius saying, "Try forge only with only their stuff." Well, Octavius, I have. I have made iron from dirt, and I still make very good quality stuff. I have, I mean, I have gone straight up. I have actually pulled iron uh, from South Georgia dirt. I have steeled it. In fact, that's one of the things that I've been thinking about filming here the next couple months is actually making steel, uh, making iron and steel, and making a hammer out of it because I've done it before. And guess what? I made good-looking tools. I made tools that were lined up, that were straight, and everything else. So, you know... And I and my you know I've never had any formal training myself. Uh, I have had a lot of time you know spent on YouTube, like many of you, read a lot of books. And the crazy thing is, the first time that I read my first book, which wasn't the best, I would say Percy Blandford's um, book is the book I started with, not the greatest. But by the time I got through reading that book, I was more educated than most of the, most of the Smiths of antiquity, and. You've got to understand that, you know, they were very clannish back in the day. When they had the blacksmithing guilds, the entire idea was to keep trade secrets. That's really where trade secrets started. That's why you've got the masons and things of that nature. So, you know, as you guys going along your blacksmithing journey, if you get the chance to go look at the tools of antiquity, pay close attention to how much a lot of them kind of sucked. And understand that even though you get out there in the backyard and you make your pair of rebar tongs, the fact is, is those rebar tongs are most likely better than what most average smiths produced back in the day. Um, and probably, and I, man, you have no idea how much it hurts my soul to say this, probably a better quality of iron, even though it's rebar. Um, it's always very healthy to go back and look into these pictures and these artifacts so that we can understand exactly where we've come from and where we stand. Uh, I was talking with one of my former students, Justin Bailey, uh, a little bit earlier today. And of course, with everything getting ready, hopefully we're going to open up the house here and start having classes. He came down for a class a couple years ago. And, you know, by the time we got done for the weekend class, they were making good quality pieces better quality, better quality pieces than I see in a lot of the historical record. Now, of course, the historical record is skewed. There's only going to be, you know, so many pieces that got saved. But by and large, I'm always astounded at kind of how much the tooling sucked and how, how, how it is so far removed from what we do today. Anyway, well, guys, like I said, I wanted to get that in there real quick. Um... Like I said, I'm <clears throat> starting to fade a little bit here, so I'm gonna a new, uh, I'm gonna skip the Q and A for this evening if you don't mind, till I get a little bit better. But um, like I said, guys, it, it, there's just uh, there's so there's such a rich history in the blacksmithing, but yet even for those of us that are in this trade, you know, think about it. You know, as much as you love blacksmithing, have you ever actually put your real eyes on a blacksmithing artifact, like the real tooling? And I mean, you know. Like I said, here in the States, it's 100 years old. It's great, right? Um, but, hey, you know, have you ever seen the old stuff? You know, medieval times. Um, take a look. It's worth a look. Oh, by the way, um, I want to say, uh, Provo, I saw you come in, man. <laughs> uh, Provo is a tremendous supporter. Um, is a pr tremendous supporter here at the channel. And uh, actually, uh, he got his book on there. And like I said, if you hadn't gotten my book, like I said, the table of contents is rather interesting. Uh, but I did receive my package. Provo has very graciously donated us uh, some locomotive 
knuckle pins, I believe. They seem to be of, it's mystery steel, but it seems to be of high quality. And I believe one of the videos we're going to do here next week is going to be actually turning one of those into a punch. So we've got some good stuff coming. I just wanted to make sure and, uh, and tell him how much we appreciate it and that. Speaking of which, uh, there's a lot of folks here uh, in the chat tonight uh, that you absolutely need to, uh, you know, if you have not think, there's a lot of Patreons here. Uh, all of this content, the vast majority of, of what you guys see is, is funded by these guys. Uh, they are uh, the ones that support the channel. So, you know, make sure, understand that this is not done. This is not done on vapors and goodwill. I have a very, they're, they're, they're great to actually hang loose. So, um, yeah, thank you guys very, very much. Appreciate you being here. And uh, like I said, more good stuff coming out a little bit later on. You guys be safe. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pretend like I'm a, I'm a meth smurf. <laughs> you guys 